July of 1806, William Clark and 13 members of the Corps of Discovery uh, came along the Yellowstone River and we believe that they walked on this very ground right here uh, and created a camp where they built canoes to descend not only the Yellowstone River but all the way down to St. Louis. If this is indeed the site, this would only be the third known site. It's, on the other hand, also only one of many different uh, uh, sites that people say is this is the site. And, and many of them are, well, it's down there because Grandpappy told me it's on my land kind of thing. And everybody wants it to be on their land. to all the other maps and aerials that we did to find out where the river had moved, we went back to Clark's map himself and used that. And so anytime I do a morphology study on any river that has been involved with Lewis and Clark, that's the very first map I will start with in doing a fluvial morphology study. point in this area and he went down and got to Columbus went over the Columbus West Hill right at the edge of it he came up over the top of the Indian uh, above Columbus of the Indian Fort on the Columbus East Hill dropped back down again across the flats and went down to where they made the canoes on the way down the Elston River Valley a member of the party fell, uh, fell in a stick went several um, several centimeters into his leg, and he was severely injured. And um, he was in a uh, enough pain that it was very difficult to uh, to ride horses. And so Clark was looking for a place anyway to make canoes, and this probably advanced his his thinking, um, uh, his agenda to to get the canoes made so that he could carry the injured person much more comfortably. Uh, he came here, uh, thought that these were a tolerable size, still continued after he was here to uh, send people downstream the next morning to see if there were any larger ones, and uh, there were no bigger ones downstream, and so he said, well, this is what we'll do, and so he made two canoes that he then lashed together. Uh, the site, not only did it have uh, trees that were big enough and straight enough, um, there was also the, the way that the river bent, there was a nice place where they could launch the canoes, fair, load and launch the canoes fairly effectively. And um, at least according to uh, the study of our fluvial geomorphologist, and um, and so uh, this really does seem to be a prime location uh, to uh, to have made uh, the canoes, even if the trees weren't quite as big as he would have liked. We've we've been doing this since 2011, so this is our third and hopefully final year. Uh, it started out as a class project for uh, his, uh, Historical Archaeology of the Americas at NSC Billings. So most of the people that have come out and moved most of the dirt have been students. A number of those students have continued to come out since, even after the class is wrapped up. And um, so that's been, that's been absolutely wonderful. Well, I started with this project in 2011 uh, with the archaeology class at MSUB. Um, and I, after the class, I continued to work on it um, with, with Dr. Rust on this project through uh, present day. Um, and even after I graduated, I've continued to work on it. We've been out here in all the elements. I mean, there's been days where it's been a four season day where it's snowed, it's rained, sun comes out, and then you get covered with ticks all in one day. It was, I mean, those are things that you learn and then those are, are things that bring good memories, you know, and, and laughter, I guess. If we can confirm that this is the site, it would be one of the three sites that they, where they actually can pinpoint where they can, which is, I mean, amazing for considering that they traveled from St. Louis to, to the Pacific Ocean in this Oregon and then coming back through Montana. I mean, that's, that's just amazing. And then to be a part of that, you know, I mean, like, who knows, in 20 years, it, people may be coming here to, you know, just look at the area. And uh, to know that you were a part of that is, is pretty impressive and a great opportunity. Well, being able to go out um, with Dr. Rust and on, on an archaeological dig in your own backyard and discover something about where you live and somewhere you consider a part of your life that you never knew. It's not something you can, you can just 
read about. It's not something you can just memorize on a flashcard or fill in on a bubble on a test. I mean, this is a real life experience and it's in your hands. It's physically, you're holding it in your hands. You're holding history in your hands. There's, there's nothing better than that. Uh, what really struck me with this archaeology project was the fact that I first wanted to be on an archaeology project at some point, so it was one of those bucket list things. Um, and then the second, of, uh, second thing is the fact that we keep finding evidence um, and that, it, it, that it's scientific evidence that links back to um, Lewis, and, Lewis and Clark and the, and the campsite, which is very interesting and that's what really intrigues me. Well, we have a number of, of incidents of, uh, uh, shall we say, um, uh, lines of evidence that would suggest that this is the site. Um, first of all, it's where possibly um, the data from the journals, not only from the descriptions and the maps, but also his survey data would suggest that, that this is the site which um, Ralph Sanders um, um, uh, uh, figured out. So we took uh, Ralph's work and he said it's here. So then we came in with our plan and we, we've surveyed, we've done geophysical surveys, we've done, which uh, kind of looks below the surface before we excavate. We've done uh, test samples, uh, small excavation units and then larger excavation so 18, units. And what we've discovered is that we have a fire feature um, with a uh, geophysical trail, which uh, anomaly of some sort that looks like a trail from that fire feature to the river in Clark's Day. It looks like it's perpendicular to the river in Clark's Day. And the fire feature itself carbon dates within an acceptable range for, um, for, the, uh, for it to be possibly related to Lewis and Clark. The um, 300 feet, uh, approximately 300 feet from that fire feature, we've also found localized spots of mercury. Now, in and of itself, um, we have uh, one line of evidence with the fire feature. The, the localized mercury is, is very intriguing because that is oftentimes what um, is as close to a smoking gun as you can get on a Lewis and Clark site, especially if it follows military protocol. And the military protocol at the time, which was um, something called the Blue Book or the regulations of the time, it, there's a longer title to it, but it was kind of nicknamed the Blue Book. It was written by Baron von Steuben during the Revolutionary War for George Washington. And it states from your fire, from your kitchen, um, your latrines are to be 300 feet away and there's to be one dug every three days or more frequently in, in warm weather. Well, we found two localized spots, both of which are about 300 feet um, away from the fire features. This is the area that we thought or we believe is the latrine. Uh, we were out here on the spring day, um, kind of similar to this, not as warm, uh, and about what uh, 25 to 50 uh, centimeters down, uh, we started noticing um, uh, mercury. Uh, Dr. Russ did an Irish jig around uh, the, the dig here, um, and all of us were just ecstatic. And about two meters away from one of those localized mercury, we found a, uh, a small lead ball. Um, it's about 375 uh, inches in diameter, 0.375 inches in diameter, which would be a, a little over 37 caliber, or maybe 38 caliber, somewhere between 37 and 38 caliber. Um, we've done a lead isotope analysis on that, which is uh, looking at the chemical signature of the lead. And that chemical signature um, is, is uh, nearly exact to um, uh, a lead artifact found at Traveler's Rest, which is a, another known um, Lewis and Clark, confirmed Lewis and Clark campsite. And when I say nearly exact is because there's some instrumentation variants and so, but it's within that. So, I mean, statistically what we're saying is that it's, it's, it's an exact match. And uh, in fact, of the what's called the USGS DOE database of samples of, of lead from around the world, the closest that our lead matches is the Traveler's Rest isotope signature. Um, and we've looked at thousands of, of, um, of isotope signatures. So that feels very good to us as well. So we're starting to, starting to get uh, more and more confident that, that this is the site then. Um, we have a number of artifacts that are um, also, possibly, though not as diagnostic as we'd like, as say the artifact, uh, the, the, the lead ball artifact. But uh, we found a buckle, we found a piece of strap iron, 
Um, we found uh, 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 other lead. We found some um, some bones, so it, it, that have uh, uh, cultural signs on them, marks that looks as though they've been cut. Um, so therefore, we feel fairly confident that this was a campsite and that the probability um, of it being um, uh, related to Lewis and Clark can be considered fairly high. Normally, people would look at the amount of change in this river, and if you look at a map and see how the river has moved all around here, it, it's just, it's miraculous that this particular site is still here. The second part of that, though, however, is that it is in a process of receiving significant erosion on the bank immediately adjacent to the site. How long it will be there, we do not know. And it could be there for maybe just a year or two, and it may be decades, and maybe forever, who knows. We're about 20 meters from uh, what we believe is the latrine area. And so uh, as we continuously lose, we've lost about three meters of bank just in the last month as the water's risen. Um, we could lose significantly more, and in a few years, it may just completely obliterate the site. Um, the Yellowstone River today is still an amazing resource, uh, the longest undammed river in the United States, and it's, uh, it's, uh, which uh, has its good points and its bad points to it. And one of the bad points is, is that it could severely threaten the site, but on the other hand, um, it allows this wonderful riparian uh, habitat to remain intact. Uh, in a nearly natural state as to what Clark would have seen it perhaps in his day.